Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them. And we always start with the pick of the week. And this week's pick of the week, Feral number one from Image Comics. This is written by Tony Fleece with artwork by Trish Forstner and Tone Rodriguez and beautiful, immaculate, perfect coloring from Brad Simpson. Now this is a follow-up of sorts to Stray Dogs, which took the comic book world by storm a few years ago. It was kind of like Silence of the Lambs meets All Dogs Go to Heaven. This is like Dawn of the Dead meets the Aristocats. And Stray Dogs, as great as that was, as much as I loved that book, this one's got a little bit more something going for it, in my opinion. Number one, Stray Dogs was a limited series. I wanted to stay in that world. Well, we're back in a world similar to it, but this is an ongoing series. Also, in the original Stray Dogs book, you had layouts by Tone Rodriguez, and then you had Trish doing the art over those layouts. Here, Trish does the cats, Tone does all of the backgrounds, and then you got Brad Simpson really, really leveling up that that coloring. The coloring in this book is freaking phenomenal. It is gorgeous. This book is amazing. And it has that feel of old school animation. It feels like 70s Disney. It feels like Don Bluth films, right? Because you've got these very simple line, you got this simple line work on the cats and the foreground, and then you got really detailed textures and beautiful gradient coloring on the background, and it makes those figures pop, and it works so well. So this is basically also not against anything against dog lovers. I love dogs, but cats are my jam. I'm a proud cat dad. Ariel, station, this book is for you. I loved it. I thought it was amazing. Cute cats caught in a zombie fiction story, right? Now they're using rabies, right? And they're using the idea of bites infecting and spreading and this whole, you know, wave of rabies and stuff. And they're, they're, they're totally formatting this like a zombie movie. And Tony Fleece does such a great job with these characters. And I know that they're just cats, but it definitely has that Don Bluth energy. And I'm not just talking about the artwork. I'm talking about the story. It feels wholesome, even though it is totally, I think Tony calls it pet exploitation. Absolutely amazing. We had Tony recently on the channel just a couple of times. A few weeks ago, though, he was on there talking about this, talking about his upcoming Uncanny Valley, his work on Army of Darkness. Check out that book. I mean, check out that show because he talks more about this book. But I love it. And just like the Stray Dogs before, this will also have a series of variant covers and exclusive variant covers that are going to be homaging classic horror movie posters, including this cover B, which is straight up an homage to Dawn of the Dead, one of the greatest zombie films of all time, directed by George A. Romero. You know me, I love zombies, I love horror, I love Tony, I love Trish, I love Tone, I love Brad, I love cats. This is the pick of the week. It's easily the pick of the week. Now, I have actually gotten a sneak peek at issues one, two, and three a while ago, and the book just keeps getting better. I really am behind this book. If you were caught up in the hype for Stray Dogs, and now you're like, well, I don't know if my wallet can, can extend that far, because, you know, a lot of us have to get up all of these, these, these variant covers. In fact, there's a 1 in 50 Day of the Dead homage cover. Day of the Dead's my favorite zombie movie, period. George A. Romero. So, totally. There's also Night Living Dead, 1 in 100. I wasn't able to get a hold of that one. It's really sad. I want all three of them. That being said, I love this book. Just open it up and you're going to be amazed with the coloring, the artwork, the way that the backgrounds help those foreground figures pop. It really does feel like old school classic animation in the best way. And it's about cats having to navigate through a rabies apocalypse 
which is very akin to a, a zombie apocalypse. So, not only is this getting the pick of the week, but it's going for the hat trick, y'all. I'm giving this book pick of the week. I'm giving it cover of the week for the homage cover by Trish and Tony. And I'm giving it the smell of the week, because that's what comics are supposed to smell like. Absolutely glorious. So the pick of the week, Feral, issue number one. Let's stay with Image and go to Duke number four. Duke, issue number four. I don't know why I said it that way. I think I was trying to say Dune, and then I changed it midway through. I'm having so much fun with Duke. In fact, the entire Energon universe just soars. I love it so much. If you want to know if the Energon universe is worth the hype, I just released a video this morning of me going through Daniel Warren Johnson's Transformers number one, page by page, deconstructing it, talking about what makes it work for me, what makes it fire, what makes it pop. So check out that video because the Energon universe is legit and it's really there. Now you keep hearing all these reports about how sales keep increasing, they do. And it's not just the strength of these franchises. G.I. Joe books, Transformers books, these books have, have struggled over the course of recent decades to maintain a fan base, but man, so many people are jumping in and getting excited, especially by books like Duke. Josh Williamson knows how to do this book, and just like he's doing with Cobra Commander, he's telling a really crafty tale that's really fun and scintillating in its pace. However, it's got a completely different tone and vibe from Cobra Commander. This is more action hero, action-oriented adventure. Duke is awesome. I have never, ever in my life thought Duke was a cool character, ever. As much as I was into G.I. Joe as a kid, it was always Flint. It was always Snake Eyes. It was always Lady J. I thought Duke was the lamest. I thought he was so stupid. Man, Duke is badass here. He's like Jason Bourne energy. Tom Riley's artwork is amazing. Some of the best coloring I've seen from Jordi Belair in a while. In here, though, you got an uneasy alliance between Duke and the Baroness. You got other revelations popping in. Destro trying to still trying not to show his face, but the way that this is building up in the ending, this is perfect for old school Joe fans and new fans. Seriously, you don't have to know anything about G.I. Joe to jump into Duke or Cobra Commander, and now we got even more books coming, and I'm appreciative of that. Dan Waters on Destro, Kelly Thompson on Scarlet, but please, can we continue to keep Josh Williamson in the page, uh, on the pages, because he knows what he's doing and I'm loving the hell out of this book. Duke issue number four was great. Then we've got the six fingers here with issue number two, part of a story connected to The One Hand by Rom V. The One Hand is about a detective trying to solve a murder. This is about an unlikely serial killer participating in these murders. So you're getting to see a juxtaposition of one book from the detective's perspective, and this one from the killer's perspective as well, but there's more to it than just that. He is, like I said, an, an unwitting kind of serial killer. There's a mystery that's deepening here, and the way that Dan Waters plays with language, it's perfect for a book like this. Lots of things being explored here, and the artwork by Sumit Kumar is absolutely top-notch. Lee Lowridge on the coloring, I really really love this book. Sumit Kumar was the artist on These Savage Shores. It ties into the one hand, but both books stand on their own and artistically and thematically have different materials that they're working with, even though they are connected together. I loved this issue. I thought issue one was good. Issue two continues that momentum. I cannot wait to see how both of these series, um, how both of them eventually come to fruition. My words escaped me there for a second. All right, then we got a new one from Image called Under York, and this one was just all right. It was kind of all over the place. I thought it was a little clunky in its pacing and a little, uh, a little like disjointed. It was hard to kind of fully get into it, but it's about this woman who's part of a family of like magicians. She's out there on her own. There's a tragedy in her past. There's something disconnected about it though that just doesn't quite connect or click with me. I thought the book was all right. The art's by Mirka and Dolfo and the art's fine too, but all in all, it didn't do anything to really stand out, especially in an overcrowded week where there's some really solid bangers out this week. And once again, I apologize for using that word. I'm over 40. 
I shouldn't say that. But Under York for me was just a little bit disappointing. Then we've got Local Man, Bad Girls, issue number one. This is a one shot. And if you're reading Local Man, you definitely need to check this out. Now, I do feel like this book is going to sell more copies than Local Man typically has because it's called Bad Girls and there's straight up, there's one covers about boobs, one covers about butts. I chose the butt cover. I, I just who I am. Um, but Local Man, Bad Girls is essential if you're reading Local Man, right? It takes some of the female women characters, female women, not female uh, monsters, I guess. It takes some of the women characters of Local Man and it kind of recontextualizes some stuff. It tells stories set in the past, the present, that will lead into the future. This is essential to your understanding of what's coming up in Local Man. So if you're reading Local Man and enjoying it like I am, do not skip out on this book. Plus, it's got some butts and boobs in it, so that's pretty cool. Then we've got Sam and Twitch Case Files, issue number one, written by Todd McFarlane with artwork by Zyman Kudronsky. Um, I liked the book. I did like the book. I really like the art. It's moody. It's cool. It's a typical Sam and Twitch story. Um... You know, it's like it's like any plot you see in a buddy cop movie, like Lethal Weapon or something, where the captain's like, you've gone too far this time. Give me your guns and badges. You're suspended for a month. But of course, that's not going to stop Sam and Twitch. But you actually do feel like a fracture happening in their relationship here. And I think that's cool um, in their partnership, right? So I thought that this book was really cool. I liked the artwork. It's not quite as clean as Kudronsky can be in books like Something Epic or Blood Commandment, which just wrapped up. Um, it feels more like it feels more like Kudronsky from like a few years ago and less like the Kudronsky today, but the storytelling, the pacing, the composition, the design, it's all there. The story is a little bit cliche, but I had fun with it. The one thing I did not like about this was the lettering. The lettering's by Tom Orzakowski, who's one of the best letterers out there. He lettered most of Chris Claremont's X-Men run. He lettered early issues of Spawn fantastically well. This one... And I don't know if the original, I don't know if the original um, Sam and Twitch book, which was done by Brian Michael Bendis and eventually Alex Maleev came in on that, that was great. And it had a style of lettering where they would just, you know, they would have the letters, but there wouldn't be any balloons around them. And in here, it's kind of like distracting and it doesn't really read very well. And so I was really disappointed to see this lettering from one of the absolute goats of lettering in this industry. So the lettering threw me out just a little bit, but overall I did enjoy this book. Then we've got King Spawn issue number 32. This was a very breezy issue, but I'm loving this post Spawn 350 new you that they're talking about. All the hell spawns, all the angels, all the demons, they've been depowered, um, including all the spawns. Like I said, the hell spawns. So all the agents of heaven and hell, they've been depowered, but that ain't stopping spawn from wrecking shit. You know what I'm saying? In this one, um, uh, old woman Blake, is that her name? Yeah, Granny Blake, she's been kidnapped in the last issue. That's really pissed off Al, and he's going to town. And it doesn't matter if he's up against demons, angels, or vampires. It doesn't matter to him that he doesn't have his powers and his symbiote costume's not working because he's just wrecking shit all the way through. He's tearing ass across the city and, and doing exactly what's needing to be done. Look at that variant cover, too. I absolutely love that. That is from... Javi Fernandez. Who is the art? The art, yeah, it's all right. It's decent, but it's pretty solid as well. All right, let's talk about Savage Dragon. Savage Dragon issue 269, dudes. This book is wild. This book is so wild. I recently started just saying, you know what? Screw it. Let's just pick up Savage Dragon as it's going right now and see if we can just follow along. I may not know every detail about this new iteration of Savage Dragon. I may not know every detail about what's gone on in the past 260 something issues. I have still only ever read the original Sa uh, Savage Dragon 1, 2, and 3, right? The original miniseries. I have the hardcovers though, and I'm excited to dive into them. I got some of the original comics too. It's a run I want to piece together. But man, this book is wild. This is this book is so different than it was when it first started. It's way out. It's way less Kirby influenced and way more just underground alternative in your face. Let's see what we can do that's offensive and in poor taste. There are spider women here that shoot webs out of their yaw yaws. There is Mickey Mouse again in this issue. 
literally sexually assaulting somebody. It's 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 wild. It's weird. It's not for everybody. But I'm gonna tell you what. I like bold stuff like this. That's just like, what in the hell are you doing, Eric Larson? It cracks me up. So Savage Dragon 269. There's been some nutty stuff going on in there. Let's jump over to Marvel. We got Ultimate Spider-Man issue number three. Jonathan Hickman, Marco Cicchetto. Ultimate Spider-Man's been great, right? And the first issue set up this world. It's a new Ultimate Universe. You know, kind of this this world, this reality is curated by the Maker. And there are no superheroes in it, right? Well, the Maker's been dealt with for a time. Don't worry, he'll be back. That's what we're going to be building up to, I'm sure. Um, but now other people know that the Maker has changed and messed with history in the timeline. So they're trying to bring the heroes back. So Peter Parker gets found when he's like in his 30s, married to Mary Jane with two kids, with a job. But something's missing in his life, right? He gets... Uh, Iron Man finds him, he goes, when you were 15, you should have been bitten by this radioactive spider, but you weren't. You should have been Spider-Man. You have the choice now. Well, he makes the choice to be Spider-Man, and after the results of the second issue, which I thought was absolutely funny and thrilling, and it was great seeing this version of Peter rediscover his powers, in this one, you get the identity of the new Green Goblin, you get the introduction of the new Ultimate Bullseye, you get more stuff going on in the background with Kingpin and Uncle Ben and J. Jonah Jameson, and you get a little bit more of a... A fracture is the wrong word, but there's definitely going to be something that's splitting this family right down the middle, and it has to do with the fact that he's Spider-Man. I'm having a lot of fun with this book. It's really good. The art is great. Very excited to see what's going to happen. Now, the next issue, I believe, does have a fill-in artist. That's disappointing. I wish we could have got just six solid issues from Chichetto, but... This book is awesome. I'm loving it. And just like the Energon universe, these Ultimate books, in particular Ultimate Spider-Man, are bringing fans back into the shops and exciting them and getting them to come back and buy more comics. And the one thing that this comic book industry needs to be healthy is more readers and more people spending money. So I'm all, all here for it. Then we've got God's issue number six, Jonathan Hickman, big epic but at the same time feels like what's the point what's the point of this this is only an eight issue series we got two left and i just don't know where we're going now not that that's a bother i trust hickman i'm down for it but the book feels and i've said this before it feels like it should be so big and epic but I'm finding most of us readers just like being like, okay, so what's the payoff here? Now, I do believe that there's going to be a payoff. And if there's not, I will be severely disappointed. This was a nice, well-crafted, well-told comic book story. One and done self-contained tale. That's something that Hickman's been doing in the pages of Gods. Maybe that's something that's throwing me off. These kind of like small and personal stories in the midst of some of this crazy, chaotic, cosmic stuff. Maybe that's the maybe that's the point of the book. Maybe that's what it's trying to do. I like the art. I like the stories, but there just feels like there's something missing. And maybe that missing bit is just me needing to go back and read it all in one chunk. I don't know, but I do like it, but I don't think it's like as great as Marvel wants us to think that it is. Then we've got X-Men 97, issue number one. This, of course, is a prequel to the new X-Men 97 show. We talked a little bit about that Sunday night on Rock and Robbie Live. A lot of people liking that show. I thought it was all right and decent. So this is a prequel to that that's bridging the original series with the new one. So how did Storm get her hair cut? Well, you don't see it, but I guess you kind of find out why. You got a little Dazzler action in here. That's cool. And she looks like the uh, late 80s version of Dazzler, which I do appreciate. Um, building up certain subplots like the uh, pregnancy of Jean Grey, stuff like that. But for the most part, it just didn't work for me. It felt just... I think if you are the most hardcore X-Men animated fan, then you're going to want to check this out. If you're loving that new show, you may enjoy it. But for me, it just, it lacked something. It lacked heart. It lacked like any kind of sophisticated sense of storytelling or trying to make a good comic. And it just kind of felt like, let's put this together because we got this series coming out and we got to do it. It's kind of felt like paint by the numbers. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it just wasn't working for me. Incredible Hulk issue number 10. I like what Philip Kennedy Johnson is trying to do in this book. 
but I am, I'm, I'm, I'm out of the book. I'm just, I don't care anymore. I'm like unplugged from this book. And there's been such an inconsistent switch and shift between artists from arc to arc, from issue to issue, sometimes from page to page. It doesn't work. Now, a book like Detective Comics utilizes different artists, but it seems to work for me. Something about it here just does not work. I like this dude's art, but it doesn't seem to fit for this book and it feels a tinge bit rushed and frantic and not frantic in a good way. It's not working for me. Philip Kennedy Johnson right now over at Green Lantern War Journal Forever, for instance, that book is absolutely killing it and nailing the assignment and it's got consistent artwork. Marvel is struggling with being able to have artists have consistent schedules. And I don't know who to blame. You can blame the artist, you can blame editorial, you can blame production, publication, you can do whatever. But the fact of the matter is this, Marvel books are suffering because of inconsistent art. And it's because even when there's another artist coming in, it's not comparable to like Nick Klein. When Nick Klein's on this book, it actually soars. Marvel's doing a disservice to some of these writers and some of these titles by having uh, like disjointed, inconsistent artwork that just not does not totally match up mix up with each other. So I don't know, Incredible Hulk number 10, it's all right, but it is quickly losing me. Daredevil number seven kind of lost me a little bit too. It's all right. It's kind of like a battle between Wolverine and Daredevil and the artwork by Aaron Cooter was really cool, but there was a lot of empty space, but it kind of had a nice bit of room to breathe. And I did like the art. I do like the story, but I feel like it's running a little bit thin so far. We're seven issues in, we're on the same story. And it feels like the story doesn't warrant this many issues, right? But basically, the representations of the seven deadly sins within Matt Murdock are possessing people in his life. He's having to fight them. This one is Wolverine. You read it, it's like, all right, but I almost feel like, what was the point? It just didn't quite click for me. Daredevil's starting to lose me. Y'all, I'm done with Amazing Spider-Man. I'm sorry, I made it 46 issues. I made it through all through Gang War. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm not going to read anymore. I'm done. I'm done. I'm sorry. I'm done. I, I'm very tempted to keep reading it just so I know what's going on in the pages of Amazing Spider-Man. But this book's been so up and down. It's been so inconsistent. Things that do work don't get have any kind of payoff. Things that don't work continue to be freaking just just the main point of the book like there's too much jackpot there's too much this there's too much that it's just not working for me amazing spider-man has been pretty weak for a while now and i'm done i think i'm done i think i'm done then we got jackpot and black uh, black cat issue number one i almost said jackpot and blackjack now that would be a cool comic maybe uh jackpot and black cat issue number one yeah, I didn't like this one either. I, I, I honestly, I just, I, I detest the idea of Mary Jane as the superhero jackpot who has to click this like power collar or thing on her wrist and it gives her random powers, but always just happens to be the right power that somehow this inexperienced superhero knows how to use these powers. It's just so over the top and out there. And this is not Jed McKay. Jed McKay's been doing great work with the character of Felicia Hardy. This is not him. It just feels simple. It feels cheesy. It feels dumb. I don't like it. I just don't like it. I didn't like it. Then we got Miles Morales Spider-Man issue number 18, aka issue number 300. So a big oversized issue for kind of no reason at all, but it is one story, a bunch of different artists, and when Vicent, uh, Vincentini's on the book, it soars. I love this dude's art, and it has a good solid opening and a good solid middle, but the problem is, or the or a good solid ending, but the problem is all the stuff in the middle, it's all right. In fact, it was the best spider book I read this week. But for $8.99? $8.99, you're making us pay for this book? And it's not even a self-contained story. It doesn't completely wrap up a story. It doesn't start a new story. It's just the middle part of a story for $8.99. So Marvel's basically like, Screw you fans, you're paying nine bucks or you're not going to read the book. Maybe we shouldn't read it. Anyway, let's jump over to DC.
And from DC Comics, we have Batman Dark Age, issue number one, from Mark Russell, Mike, and Laura Allred. Well, you know if the Allreds are attached to it, I'm going to be excited for it, and this was no disappointment to me. I absolutely loved it. Now, if you read Superman Space Age, it's kind of like that same approach, but to Batman. So you got this cool, Allred, quirky, pop art, retro kind of vibe with this story, with the art. I really do like it. It's a whole new origin for Batman. Bruce is a little bit more of a spoiled brat, a little bit more of a more of a petulant man-child, but the, 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 the inner workings of what's going on with Wayne Enterprises and how it's tied into the upcoming Crisis event, because this is mostly set in the 50s and 60s and whatnot, it's, it's a different spin on it, but I really appreciated that different spin. It's got that whole Mark Russell kind of vibe where it's a little bit tongue-in-cheek. It doesn't take itself too seriously, but at the same time, does take itself rather seriously. And it's the Allred work that really makes this book shine. Like I said, an Elseworlds type tale, a different approach to the Batman origin, but it all still works and the character is still Batman 100% inside and out. I loved this. I thought it was great and a super solid follow-up to Superman Space Age. Then we've got Detective Comics here with issue 1083. We are in the final act of Ron V's sweeping, tragically romantic, operatic Batman tale that is mythological. It gets straight to the core of Batman. Now, we had a discussion about this on Rockin' Robbie Live Sunday night. What's the difference between Chip Zdarsky's Batman and Ron V's Detective? Chip Zdarsky's Batman is the Batman book that is plugged into main DC continuity that is helping build up into absolute power, and there should always be a Batman book like that. But there also needs to be Batman books that are a little bit different. Maybe just simple self-contained detective stories, or maybe something big and sweeping and operatic like this. If I told you the story of this book, if I told you the story of Rombie's Detectives comics, you would say, been there, done that. But it's never been done in this way before. Yeah, we've seen Batman wrestle with his demons. We've seen Batman have to question who he is and his place in Gotham. We've seen an outside force come into Gotham to upend what Batman thinks he knows about Gotham and take him unawares and him have to fight and find that identity and that courage and that resolve again. But we've never seen it done in such a tightly structured, operatic way that is downright mythological. This, to me, is a perfect follow-up to the Grant Morrison work on the character. 100%. Rom V's killing it. Bunch of different artists here, but it works because each scene, each artist is doing a different thing tonally and atmospherically, and it works. Even when it, even when the styles are so drastically different from page to page, it never feels disconnected or disjointed for me. And I think that's applause to the artist and to the writer as well. Also though, the Ricardo Federici bits in here, I think that the coloring could have been pumped up a little bit more. They look beautiful, but they're a little bit dark and murky in the coloring, so I just don't think they printed right. Aside from that, I'm loving Detective Comics. I'm going to be sad when Rom V ends his run. Penguin is here with issue number eight. Over the last two issues of The Penguin. So the first six issues deal with The Penguin setting up everything he needs to to come back to Gotham to take his seat of power back from his children. And then in issue seven and or six and seven, my bad, the first five issues were that. Six and seven recontextualizes the whole the whole origin of the Penguin, his relationship with Batman, why he's an informant for Batman, why he always kind of goes in and out, why he's treated differently than other villains for Batman. I said, I'm up in the air about that. I don't know what Tom King's doing here. I don't know if I really dig on it, but I'll tell you what, after reading issue number eight, yeah, I'm all here for it. I'm on board 199%. My bad, 169%. I am down for what Tom King is doing in the pages of Penguin. This is a mean, spirited book that has lots of shocking revelations that wind up working. Penguin is a very menacing, foreboding presence in this book. And now that everything's been set up for him, He's back in Gotham, he's ready to take that power back, and he is ruthless with it. Penguin rocks. Plus, you got the return of artist 
This is Raphael de la Torre, I believe. I love this art. I love this story. I love this approach. I love this structure. For a book that I was not sold on at all, on issue number one, from two and on, it's just winning me over month to month. Then we got Flash here with issue number seven. Cy Spurrier writing a very challenging Flash book that at times is downright confusing to me. I cannot pick up every single nuanced detail of the quantum mechanical, timey, wimey stuff that's going on here, the extra dimensional stuff. And there was even a moment where I was like, maybe I need to wait until it's all done, all 12 issues are done, and then read it that way. No, because every single issue, even if it's a challenging read, even if I don't fully understand all of the concepts that are being put before me, each issue is a really good solid issue. This one focusing on Max Mercury and Bart Allen and Barry Allen. Not so much Wally, but when Wally comes back into the story, there's a big reveal. I love it. I know a lot of people are confused by this Flash run. They're losing patience with it. Not me. I think the book loses patience with me. The book is like, yo, Robbie, keep up, keep up, because it's not waiting for me to catch up. It's not slowing down for me. It's not taking its audience for granted. It's not insulting the intelligence of the audience. In fact, it's making us work for it. High concept sci-fi stuff that is wild and weird in The Flash. This is what a Flash book should, want, should be. And I'm all here for it. And issue number seven was great. Plus, Hassan Antman El Howe is killing it on the lettering. He uh, did he letter this one? Now I'm uh, now I'm doubting if he actually lettered this one. Of course he lettered this one. You can totally tell. Why should I doubt myself? Green Arrow number ten is here. Josh Williamson is doing a great job with the character of Oliver Queen, but his place at the head of the Green Arrow legacy. That's right. There is a whole legacy element to DC Universe that Josh Williamson gets and. Green Arrow is no exception to that, and I'm down for it. Green Arrow's having to work with Waller to try to find Roy Harper. Um, last he saw Roy, Roy was dead. Last Roy saw Ollie, Ollie was dead. And so it's also referencing stuff from Heroes in Crisis. And what I love is that even though Heroes in Crisis to me is not a good book and kind of something best left forgot... No, Josh Williamson's going to mine that and mine it better than anybody else has since or even during. I think this was an absolutely fantastic book. Plus, you got returning characters that we have not seen in a long time. There is a huge legacy to Green Arrow. Josh Williamson is making sure you know exactly how influential and important that legacy is. Alan Scott, Green Lantern, issue number five here. A little bit of a clunky issue. I've been really liking this series, but this one just loses me a little bit. They're trying to make us, after building up the villain and making him seem almost near unforgivable, to try to like, to try to get us to kind of side with them and understand them or this and that, it just comes across a little bit clunky. This, to me, was the weakest issue through art, through color, through the writing. Just didn't work for me, but it's the penultimate issue. There's only one left, and the ending was very satisfying and does set up what should be a really thrilling climax to this book. Alan Scott, Green Lantern, I've been digging it, but this issue took a little bit of a step down. Ghostbusters, back in town, issue number one. David M. Boer writing Ghostbusters for Dark Horse. This is a prequel to the new film. Um, I saw the new film, Frozen Empire, um, on Sunday. I did a review Sunday night on Rockin' Robbie Live. I enjoyed it. I didn't think it was the greatest movie. In fact, I think it was a little bit overstuffed with characters and nothing really quite fully clicked to the, to what it, to the potential that was there because there was just so much going on. And if you took certain characters out of the movie, the movie really wouldn't change, right? However, I did enjoy the movie. So I was excited to check this one out. It's like a prequel. It's set right between Afterlife and Frozen Empire. If you want to know how they got to New York, how they got back to the firehouse, here's the story of it. The, the dialogue was great. The story was fine. All the characters seemed very real and accurate to how they're portrayed in those movies. The art, though, was just a little bit weak. Didn't, well, didn't really, it was nothing to write home to mother about. But over and all, it was a solid book. If you're a hardcore Ghostbusters fan and you like the new movies, definitely check that out. Then we've got The Goon, Them That Don't Stay Dead, issue number one from Eric Powell, back at Dark Horse. I love The Goon. Such a fun book, and this is no exception. 
great black and white artwork. It's got that goon kind of sense of humor. It's got a sense of fun about it, but there is a bit of urgency that happens throughout the issue. Goon is a great book. If you've never read an Eric Powell Goon book, you could start here and just follow along. If something's confusing, don't worry, it will be explained. But I would encourage everybody, if you can, to go back and read all the Goon stuff because Eric Powell is crafting a world that is... I'll tell you what, if you like Hellboy, The Nocturnals, if you like this pulpy horror kind of vibe and independent comic creators doing their own jam on their own thing, then definitely check this out. It's a very welcome return to the goon with Them That Don't Stay Dead, issue number one. Also from Dark Horse, we got The Oddly Pedestrian Life of Christopher Chaos, issue number eight. I'm loving this book. Tate Brombaugh is doing a great job with this. But now that the first arc is done, let's take a look at the origin of Adam Frankenstein. That's what started in the last issue and continues on here. It's a very cool tale that has references to the old book and to the old movies, but in a different light with a different perspective and it works for me. I love it. I love the tragic nature of the Frankenstein character in the pages of Christopher Chaos. I cannot wait for us now to get back to the current day and continue on now that we know a more rounded version of who this Adam Frankenstein is and how it's going to connect to the threat that's going to be threatening Christopher Chaos and his crew. That's a great book that not a lot of people are talking about. All right, from Mad Cave Studios, we got Morning Star issue number one. This is written by D.B. Andre and Tim Daniel with artwork by Marco Finnegan, Jason Wordy on the coloring, Justin Birch on the lettering. I really did like this book. It doesn't really... The one thing I should say is maybe this first issue should have been oversized to give us a little bit more oomph by the end. But it's about this dude who seems to die under very mysterious and even supernatural circumstances in a wildfire in Montana. Then we clip cut forward to his wife and kids kind of dealing with the aftermath of it and in particular his son who is kind of like kind of like falling back into a fantasy world he's like dealing with it in maybe a not so healthy way um the art is great the coloring is great the pacing is great the the composition the panel design everything worked and when you get to the end i'm sold and i'm ready to come back for more but maybe there should have just been a little bit more I'm not saying you tell us the whole mystery in the first issue, but it feels to me like I don't know if this book delivered enough of that mystery in the first issue to really hook us in, but the characters, their conflicts, their relationships, their dynamics, it's very well-rounded, and to me, that's good storytelling, and I'm definitely coming back for more. So Morningstar issue number one. That's a pretty solid book. Then we got Conan the Barbarian, issue number nine, Jim Zub, and the return of Roberto. I do believe this is Roberto. Where are, where are the, there they are. Rob De La Torre, right? This dude is straight up like the, the reincarnation of John Basima. Like this artwork is straight up John Basima type stuff. So this book has gone from a really solid, old school, savage, sword kind of Conan to like, wow, what are we doing in the second arc? And then the way the second arc ended, you're like, what? And then where that leads was really interesting. And I don't want to spoil the book, but I'll tell you this, Conan versus Cole. How about that? Jim Zub and Latori and company, they've been killing it in the pages of Conan the Barbarian. I loved this issue. Really excited to see how this develops. All right. Then we got Street Fighter Masters, Akuma versus Ryu. I don't typically read Street Fighter books. Sometimes I grab them because they got sexy covers, and I do try to read them. Same thing with Darkstalkers, and I just don't, don't, don't dive into them. This was actually pretty cool. Now, the story's all right. I did feel a little bit confused, but I was able to follow along. It's Akuma versus Ryu. They're referencing a bunch of stuff that I don't know, and that's fine. What really sold me on this book was the art. The art on this has a rough, raw, like gritty texture to it. It's Kenneth Lowe. Not familiar with this dude's work, but I really want to be more familiar. I really, really like this approach. Usually in these Street Fighter books from Udon, you're going to find very clean, kind of like manga-influenced art. This one feels more like 
a grittier, rougher, more frantic version of something like Fist of the North Star. I really, really liked this book. I loved the coloring. I love the art. Story's okay. But y'all, if you get to your shop and you see this, just open it up and take a look at that art. I can't think of a Street Fighter book that has art in it quite like that. Then we got the nasty issue number eight. This is the final issue of the John Lee series that is kind of a love letter to the video nasties of the 80s, right? What a very, very satisfying and compelling conclusion to the series. It also sets up some stuff. Um, there are a couple things that maybe fall in a bit too conveniently to make everything work out, but this has been a really great great book that I've loved. You know me, I love horror. I love John Lee's and I love talking with John Lee's about horror. We've had him on the show before. Me and him could probably go for hours talking about horror movies and you feel that love pouring out of every single page, every single word balloon, every single character in this book. And it's got a really great, even though it may be a bit after school specially, it's after school specially in my kind of way. I liked it. My only nitpick with this book is I do think maybe two issues too long. I think this whole eight issue thing could have been fit in the six, but I digress. I will read it when the collection comes out. I'll read it all at once, and then I'll have more of an accurate sense of how the flow of the story is, because the book has dealt with some delays. That's something that's been plaguing Vault Comics lately. All right, then we got Somna issue number three from Distillery. Uh, Becky Cloonan, Tula Lote, Really did love issue one. I liked issue number two. I don't know how I felt about issue three. It was an okay ending. Kind of generic. Kind of okay. Didn't really quite click for me. Artwork felt a bit more rushed. Mostly the Lotte stuff. The lettering was a little bit off. A little bit fuzzy. I don't know if that's printing or if there was something different going on there. Um, but I was kind of disappointed in this ending. I thought it was alright. I thought it was decent. But it didn't give me the punch that I wanted at the end of a book like this, which is kind of folk horror, witch, Puritan type stuff. It's been done and it's been done better. And the book had a lot of sexiness going for it. It continues that here, but the ending and its theme, it just gets a little bit jumbled for me at the end. It just does not quite clearly define an ending for me that works. It's okay. It's decent. I'm not hating on it. But it just was a little bit disappointing. All right, and also real quick, trade paperback wise, Ultimate Invasion is out in trade paperback now. I know a lot of people didn't necessarily read this when it was first released, but now people are really into Ultimate Spider-Man, Ultimate Black Panther, even Ultimate X-Men. People are down for the Ultimate Universe. They're liking it. So if you missed out on Ultimate Invasion and you're having trouble finding them, the trade paperback is out right now. But I will say, it collects Ultimate Invasion 1 through 4. It does not have the Ultimate Universe one-shot. That is being reprinted in April. So that that's going to be coming out. But would it have been so hard to put that in this trade? It should have been put in this trade. Why not? So you can sell us a deluxe edition hardcover later on down the road. Shame, Marvel. You should have put the Ultimate Universe one-shot in here. It doesn't make any sense why you didn't. Anyway, so Ultimate Invasion is here in trade paperback. Ultimate Universe... Uh, one shot coming back in a second printing. So check it out. We may uh, reread that and maybe do a top down look. You let me know if you want to see it. All right. So to recap, Somno was a little bit of a disappointing ending. The Nasty did not disappoint at the ending. After school special horror love right there. Street Fighter Masters, Akuma vs. Ryu. Amazing art, a decent story. Conan the Barbarian. Yo. This is awesome. I love it. Morningstar, really great start. Maybe could have given us a little bit more, but still enough for me. The oddly pedestrian life of Christopher Chaos continues to impress. The goon is back and I could not be happier. Ghostbusters back in town. Perfect if you're a fan of those new movies, but if you're just kind of a casual, just kind of maybe step away. Alan Scott, Green Lantern, a little bit clunky. Worst issue of that series yet, but I'm still on board. Green Arrow, Josh Williamson keeps getting better and better on that series. The Flash, challenging high concept sci-fi that I am all here for. The Penguin, my favorite Tom King book in a long time. I love the hell out of that Penguin book. Detective Comics continues to be what Detective Comics is. Batman Dark Age, Mike and Laura Allred, enough said. Then we got Miles Morales, Spider-Man. No reason this should be $9 and so damn long. Jackpot and Black Cat sucked. Uh, Amazing Spider-Man sucked. Um, Daredevil number seven didn't suck, but it wasn't that good for me. Incredible Hulk losing me. 
X-Men 97 did not really work for me. Might work for you. Check it out. Gods works, but does it? I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see on that one. Ultimate Spider-Man, though, slapped. This was awesome. This was really cool. I said slapped. I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say banger. I shouldn't say slap. Let's see. What's more appropriate for my age? This was tubular, kids. This was radical. Savage Dragon cracks me up. I cannot believe the stuff that <laughs> that, that Eric Larson is doing right there. King Spawn and Sam and Twitch, both great Spawn books. I liked them this week. Bad Girls, got some butts in it. Check it out. Uh, Under York did not work for me. I thought it was a little disappointing. Six Fingers, though, was really impressive. So was Duke. I'm loving the Energon universe. But the pick of the week is Feral number one. Why? Great cover, great smell, great art, great story. That's what makes a great comic. That's what makes the pick of the week. That's what I read. That's what I thought. That's what I was digging. What are you reading? What are you digging? What are you thinking? Let us know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for checking out the video. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and join us over at patreon.com slash PCP if you want to help support the channel. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Station. Keep on reading. Pop, pop, boom!